What have you got here in the present moment? You've got the body, you've got the mind. You've got the breath, you've got thoughts, and you've got your awareness. But you're also carrying a lot of habits. In fact, these are the main issue in the meditation. If you didn't have certain habits of perception, you wouldn't be creating suffering for yourself right now. You may not seem to be suffering a lot, but there's always some stress that you're creating out of a lack of skill. And it's precisely that that we're working on as we meditate. Some of this baggage you're bringing into the present moment is simply issues that you picked up in the course of the day. Things that this person said, that person did, things you yourself said or did. In some cases, it's as if you've been a garbage collector. If you're going to get any peace in the next hour, you've got to throw out the garbage. But the problem goes deeper than that. If that were the only problem, you'd go off and live alone, where you wouldn't have to interact with people, and that would be the end of the problem. But that's not the end of the problem. You go off and live by yourself, and the habits of the mind start looming even larger. And the less contact you have with people, the more it's, they're likely to go out of bounds. You get in some really weird feedback loops when you're living alone. But the Buddha sets out maps, he sets out instructions for how to cut through those feedback loops and understand how your perception shapes things in such a way that you suffer, and also showing you how to perceive things in a new way that will cut through that suffering, end those habits. So that ultimately when there is or perception of the breath, or any of the sensory inputs you have in the present moment. There's no suffering added on top of them. That's the only disturbance you have. There's no greed, anger, and delusion to muck up the works. As the Buddha said, it all comes down to ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. And he's not talking about not having read about the Four Noble Truths. All of us here have read about them, have thought about them. The issue is not seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. We create other issues to pull us away. Some of the big ones are our sense of self, or are things that belong to us our sense of the reality of the world out there, what exists, what doesn't exist out there. And then we find ourselves a slave to these things. Our idea of objective reality places a lot of imperatives on us. Our idea of who we are places a lot of imperatives on us. And these are the imperatives that make us suffer. So the Buddha teaches us to learn how to question those perceptions. There's a passage when he talks about how people are enslaved to a duality or a polarity between existence and non-existence. Does the world out there really exist? Does it not really exist? But he says you want to avoid that polarity. And the way you do it is just simply watching things arising and passing away in the present moment. And the best way to do that is to give yourself a framework. This is what the four foundations of mindfulness and the four frames of reference are all about. giving yourself a framework so that you're not blown away by the events of the world. You see things within the frame of body or feelings, mind states, mental qualities. Those become your frames of reference. Like when you're dealing with the breath right now, it's just the breath coming in, going out. Thoughts are important to the extent that they pull you away from the breath or don't pull you away from the breath. While you're sitting here, ideally that's the only question. 
how do thoughts impinge on the breath? And then there are the thoughts that are useful in keeping it with the breath. Those are the ones you want to encourage. And from that point, he says, you can abandon greed and distress with reference to the world, the world here being the world of the senses. Because it's only when you can abandon greed and distress with reference to these things that you should look at them for how they're directly experienced. See how sights and sounds and smells, tastes, tactile sensations are experienced right here in the present moment. He says, if you can watch these things arising and passing away simply in and of themselves, the whole issue of what exists out there and what doesn't exist out there gets put aside. As you watch things arise, the idea that there is nothing out there doesn't occur to you. As you watch them pass away, the idea that there is something out there, permanent, lasting, existing independently of you, that doesn't occur to you either. He's not saying that things do exist or don't exist out there. It's just that in that mental state, the issue doesn't occur to you. That's the mental state you want to put yourself into. Because what that leaves is simply the issue of the arising and passing away of stress and suffering. That gets you right in line with the Four Noble Truths. And then you begin to see what you're doing that's giving rise to the suffering. You start seeing the fabrication of the worlds of the mind, You're realizing that that world really exists more in your mind, the world as you perceive. The world out there is really your own mental construct. You have lots of different mental constructs about the world out there. Sometimes you think about the world in geological terms, sometimes you think about it in cosmic terms, sometimes you think about it simply in terms of your own personal narrative from day to day. There are many different levels that are useful for different things. And you want to put yourself in a state of mind where you can choose what view of the world is useful right here, right now, but where you're not a slave to the imperatives that these different views put on you. And the same with your notion of self. Is there a self? Is there no self? The Buddha says, don't ask that. And yet, so much of our life depends on our idea of who we are. And again, you'll notice, if you really look at the arising and passing away of your sense of self, seeing how it is a construct, just the way your, your sense of the world is a construct, then you're in a much better position. You can use different ideas of the self to function in different ways, and then you drop them. But all this is possible if you keep in mind as your basic framework the whole issue of what gives rise to suffering, what kind of action doesn't give rise to suffering, or what kind of action leads you to the end of suffering. The basic framework of the Four Noble Truths, seeing your experience in those terms, rather than in terms of the world or the self. Because then you can see the activities that you do, the fabrications that you make, bodily fabrications, verbal fabrications, mental fabrications simply as strategies, useful or unuseful, skillful, unskillful. And that's liberating. Because on the one hand, you find that you can function a lot more skillfully as you open up the idea that maybe there are more courses of action open to you than you might have imagined. If you have a very definite idea of who you are, the type of person you are, Sometimes that's very limiting in terms of what you can do. Again, if you have very fixed ideas about the world out there, that's limiting on what you can do in terms of putting an end to suffering and stress. So what we're trying to do as we meditate here is give ourselves the frame of reference from which we can call into question our ideas of the world, call into question our ideas of the self. See how both of them are fabrications, made out of the way we look at things, the way we attend to things, the way we perceive things. And then the intentions that are based on those ways of looking at the world, looking at the self. 
start calling them into question, looking for alternatives, testing alternatives. We're well, the overriding concern of seeing what we can do to put an end to all the stress and suffering we're causing by our unskillful intentions. Because as you look at your experience in these terms, the constant question of what are you doing and what are the results that you're getting out of what you do, you can open yourself to whole new dimensions inside. You can use your ingenuity and figure out new ways of acting. New ways of interacting with your perceptions of the world, new ways of interacting with your perceptions of self that free you from the stress and suffering that deep down inside you think are a necessary part of being a human being. This is so much of what the Buddha's teaching is about, is freeing you from your own self-imposed limitations. Think about all those people who told the young prince, there's no way you can put an end to suffering. The best people in the history of the world have had to suffer. And the prince said, there must be some other way. He had the ability to imagine that there would be another way, and then the guts to devote his life to finding if it were true. And finally finding, yes, it was. It wasn't just a leap of the imagination, but it was also opening new possibilities, what a human being can do. Remember his analysis of action. Most people would think of only the first three, things that give rise to good results within the normal course of the world, things that give rise to bad, things that give rise to mixed results. But then he found there was another kind of action entirely that leads to the end of action, leads to the end of suffering. That was his great discovery. Notice that it was a kind of action that he discovered based on certain views, based on certain perceptions, based on certain ways of looking at experience, and then following through. So as we're practicing meditation, remember that perception and attention, the way we perceive things, the questions we ask about the things we perceive, these are the two main issues that we have to focus on. It's one of the reasons why we focus on concentration. These are perception attainments. When you hold on to a particular perception, see what it does to your experience. When you perceive the breath as filling the body, what does that do to your perception of the breath? When you perceive the breath as being able to come in and out of the body anywhere at all, what does that do to your perception? What effect does it have on the mind? When you get to the formless perceptions, space, infinite space, what in your realm of experience right here corresponds to infinite space? Infinitude of consciousness, nothingness, neither perception or non-perception. We ex investigate these things so that we can see the power of perception. So that ultimately we can let it go. So this is a very important thing to focus on as you meditate, and as you go through the course of the day, how you perceive things. It begins with simply how you perceive your interactions with other people. Notice how much of, how much of your perception of the situation is just that, your perception. And we talk about the, the garbage we pick up or the garbage we collect in the course of the day. How much of that garbage is self-produced? To put it really crudely, you could say, okay, how much of it is your own shit that you're carrying around? This is not to say that other people are not behaving in outrageous ways or horrible ways. That there are people like that in the world. But if your peace of mind was totally dependent on everybody else's behaving themselves, you'd be their slave. 
what does the Buddha say? The whole issue of suffering is something that we can overcome through our own efforts, which means that we have to look at the suffering we create for ourselves. And as for the baggage we carry around, if we had to go back and straighten out all the horrible things we did in the past before we could get an awakening, it would never be done. But when you learn how to simply drop old habits, it's possible. Because after all, the suffering you're experiencing right now is a combination of things coming from the past, but also things you're doing right now, including the way you're perceiving things right now. And it's a constant image in meditation instructions that all you have to do is turn on a light and the darkness goes away. No matter how many aeons there's been darkness, all you have to do is turn on the light once and that's the end of the darkness. All you have to do is work on how you're perceiving things in the present moment. And when things finally click, you don't have to worry about what other people have done. You don't have to worry about the world. You don't have to worry about the self. You don't have to worry about what you've done. You've learned a new habit. You've developed a new skill. And with the development of the new skill, that changes everything.